Hello and welcome to Genealogy Adventures. Was it me this week? Or it's you? fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Okay. Hi. <laughs> and this is my lovely cousin, Donia. Yes, and my handsome cousin, Brian. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Hope you guys are all having a really, really good Sunday. Yeah, because this weather is crazy. It DC is. The is hot. It's 80 degrees outside. Mind you, it was storming this morning. It was crazy. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if anyone had told me I'd be wearing shorts and November is only a week away, I wouldn't have believed them. Yes, I swear, <laughs> I swear. So, today, we're going to be talking about genealogists and family historians as public historians. And just so that we're all on the same page, I'm just gonna read a bit of a definition. So definition of public historian, this is coming from Dr. Thomas Colvin, who teaches at Louisiana University. So his definition is public history is the use of historical skills and methods outside of traditional academic realm of history. Public historians use their training to meet the needs of the community, the public, whether that community is defined as a city, a neighborhood, a business, or a historical society. It is an audience that differenti differentiates the public historian's work. So for instance, a public historian's audience might be a client, a government agency, tourism board, or historians. So basically different, different audiences often require the public historian to employ unconventional skills. I think we've got that covered. <laughs> answer difficult questions and respond to unique situations. Okay, so with that being said, today's topic is why we don't have a seat at the table, basically, and why we should have a seat at the table, am I correct? That's correct. So with that being said, we want to give you guys um, the opportunity to, to, this is a good time for our, especially our genealogists, our genealogical followers, to log in, to, you know, to really chime in because your voice needs to be heard. And there are so many different things that are going on today, public, you know, as far as politics are concerned, um, everything that's going on with the, the state of just the world, the climate of the world right now, the things that are happening. We have a voice in that we can say something about it because of the fact that we've already researched it and seen it happen or read about it happening and these are the things that are not in our history books today these are the things that should be there in order for people to know well you know what this is really going on so well tonya mccoy hi by the way ashley and hi tonya tony has actually raised a really good point she's like if you don't have a seat at the table create your own table but sometimes you can't create that table i mean i'm so into that but how do you create a table when people are pushing you away constantly? You know what I'm saying? Write it, publish it. That's true. That's true. But then you got to get that out there to people. And then you got people that yeah. don't want to buy it. Or, you know, they're thinking yeah. you're charging too much money for it. I mean, let's just be serious. On For Black people, getting us to support each other can sometimes be very difficult. I think I said that nice. Right? Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, but, it's difficult. But one thing I would counteract with is it doesn't necessarily have to have a charge. Like genealogy adventures, people can go to our website. Right. They can read all the stuff that we've written. And in a lot of ways, that is public history that, that we're sharing. Yes, it is. Um, and again, it's not to, you know, it's not to have a swipe at historians. Historians serve a very important function. Um, this is basically talking about adding non-traditional voices to those historical conversations. And I think I was saying to you yesterday, the, the way that I kind of think about it is historians look at the entire forest and they may concentrate on certain groves of trees, whereas we're doing it the other way. We're, we're looking at the individual trees, the little groves of trees, we're trying to place them into that forest context. Mm -hmm. But our focus is really on individual people or, fa or even family members. Or communities. But it's not just the individual people, family groups, communities. We also focus on what's going on around. Yeah, exactly. So that but that's a good segue into the difference between the family historian mm -hmm. and well, you taught me differently that the genealogist was something, you know. But that's a that's a good segue into that. So when you when you talk about, in my opinion, 
when you talk about a family historian, the family historian is the person that can give you everything about the family. So they're going to be able to tell, oh, your great great grandmother from such a, was from such and such, or you, your father was this person, and so on, and this is what he did, and so on and so forth. Whereas a genealogist will be able to give some economical background. That's you know, or be able to say, well, when they were living in 1865, this is what was going on at that time, and how they were able to live and this is what, you know, their sharecropping and how much they sold and so on and so forth. So when you're looking at those two things, you start to realize or figure out what it is you are. Cause I had to figure that out for myself. At one point I was a family historian, but as I go further and deeper into my family research, my family history, I've now become a genealogist. I'm on that genealogical route. So not only do I know my family's history, but I also know what was going on during that time, what battles they had to fight, what things they had to go through, what moments in time in history that they were there to witness. But again, as a genealogist as well, you're, we're look, as genealogists tend to look at lineal descent. Right. So who begat who begat who begat right. who begat. So yeah. Kind of in our working practice, we, we're just flipping hats all the time. So we're going from being a straightforward genealogist trying to figure out who our ancestors are, mm -hmm. to then wearing our family history hat and actually filling in the gaps and telling, you know, telling their story. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so for those of you, so we're actually broadcasting in two different places. So our Facebook Live feed is up. So if you're, so you can either watch us on listenvisionlive.com, go to the WLS, WLVS tab to catch us there. Or if you want to leave a comment, because we really want to get you guys involved in this conversation too, yeah. go to our Facebook Live page, which is facebook.com slash genealogy adventures USA. And you'll be able to pick up our video there. See a couple of people leaving messages already. Hi, Tiffany. Thank Hi. you for joining us. And... Do you want to answer Tony or what did she say? Okay, so Tony says, write and write. Drive around in your trunk with, with it if you have to. I know that's <laughs> right. <laughs> she says, we have to create what we want to see. You both are visionaries. You have created this platform for us. We support you on this level. You can do it. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Y'all know I'm sentimental. Don't be doing stuff like that. I play hard person, but I'm really not. So a couple of examples that I wanted to give you of public history that have, that's been shared that I found really meaningful is George Takai. Um, I was aware that Japanese Americans had been interred um, in camps during World War II. What I didn't realize until he had actually written and publicly shared his family history was that um, his family lost everything. They lost their house, they lost their money, um, and that was one of the reasons why they got reparations. I didn't know that. I mean, like I said, I knew that they were interred, but I just assumed that when they were let go, that whatever the government took, right. it gave it back to them. Right. It didn't. So again, and I'm sure that there's books that have been written about it, um, but because, you know, I'm a big fan of George Takai, anything he's going to write, I'm going to read. And, I'm, <laughs> you know, and I did. I learned, you know, I learned something new. Um, my Native American ancestry, I mean, I have so, there are just so many people that are writing about Native American history, their history. Um, including Tiffany Huntsman, who's who's joined us today. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, I've discovered a lot about the Lundy Indians um, in North Carolina. Right. Who I'm not directly related to, but are like cousin lines. But anyway, I just really appreciated finding out about what that community was like, what their triumphs were, what barriers they had to overcome, you know, in their success stories. And, you know, to come to find out that they have a really rich, of course, I mean, of course, they have a rich, a rich history, but it was really great getting that context from a very kind of family history, public historian kind of viewpoint. Um, and as well, people who were writing about, again, extended family members of mine who were poor, they were Irish or they were Scottish. And, you know, I always wondered why they went to the mountains, like Virginia and North Carolina. Come to find out they didn't like the British. They didn't like the English. They wanted to get as far away from the English as humanly possible. Wow. But as those people are, as their descendants write those stories and share those histories, I'm just finding out so, so much more. So, okay, well, then with, with that being said, 
the stuff that you found out, the things that you, you, you know, how does it impact you? And how do you think that as a family history historian slash genealogist, how do you think that it would impact in other, like what, what would it help for other people to know about it? Does that make sense what I'm trying to ask? If I think I've got it, <clears throat> I would say, actually it explains a lot today about the Appalachians, about they have always had to be self-sufficient. They had no one else to rely on them. And even when government did start to appear in the form of established church, not well, in terms of schools and administrative buildings, there's still this kind of real dogged kind of self-determination. No one can tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. um, historically, kind of, you know, we're a forgotten people. Um, so it's made me kind of understand and appreciate that resilience a little bit more. Okay. And even when I'm hearing stories on, on the news today um, about that part of the world, because I've been reading other people's um, books or going to their websites or reading their blogs, I'm just getting such um, a real profound kind of understanding about that whole, that whole culture. Okay. All right. So then the other thing that we wanted to discuss, um, <laughs> This is going to be a great thing. I'm just going to go straight to it. <laughs> so as you guys know, certain things is, is never placed in, in, in history books. And as an Uber driver, and for those that follow me on my page, I actually wrote about me being an Uber driver one time or whatever and, and things that I come across. Um, but this particular thing, as an Uber driver, I would pick up different people all the time. And the first thing you, if you're a rider, you get in the car and the first thing you ask the Uber driver, is this the only thing you do? You know, you say, or is this something that you like? Or this is, you're, you're feeling this, what have you? And you'll say yes. And, or no, this isn't the only thing that I do. And they say, oh, what else do you do? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm a genealogist. And they're like, really, what's a genealogist? And then I go in and I explain to them and they're like, oh, that's, that's, that's amazing what have you found? And, and I'll tell them the things that I found. And most times I would tell them the story of my great, great grandmother, Martha, because I find her to not that she's more important than anybody else, but she was the first person that I found who was enslaved and she probably went through everything. So, um, and I would tell them that I was told that because of the price that she was when she was sold, which was like 1250, um, she was considered a prime breeding woman. So I would get this crazy look in, you know, in my rear view mirror and they're like, breeding, what do you mean breeding? They literally did not know that breeding existed. So I don't know how many of you guys know that breeding actually exists, it exists. And I'm getting ready to read from an Edgefield planter an Edgefield planter and his world, the 1840s journals of Whitfield Brooks. So this is his writing. This is what he wrote. I need you to understand that. Okay. It says, to cultivate the crop of 1884, the overseer has 20 young fellows, 10 young women, all of whom are breeders and four now pregnant, five boys and five girls, in all 40 hands, equal to 33 taskable hands. Do y'all need to say that again? <laughs> Maybe once more for the people in the back. Just for the people in the back, okay. For the people in the back. I'm just gonna do the first sentence then. To cultivate the crop of 1845, the overseer has 20 young fellows, 10 young women, all of whom are breeders and four now pregnant. So for those that don't think that breeding did not exist, he just wrote it. He wrote it in 1840. It did exist. It was real. They were actually taking our ancestors, our grandmothers, our great great grandmothers, and they were making them have babies to sell. This is a real thing. This is something that was never entered in any history book. I had grown men in the back of my car crying apologizing to me because they were like, I never knew this existed. So with that being said, 
these are histories that need that need to be placed in books. These are things. This is where we have to try to push this information. But Tanya said, push it. How do I push it? Because that's a horrific thing. That is totally horrific. So how do I push that? How do I give myself some type of platform where I can say, hey, this happened to my great grandmother and now I can show proof from an actual enslaver, the man who enslaved her. Now I have proof. So with that being said, how, how do I do that? What types of things would you do to do that? I mean, I, I, I wrote a book about it. But you're missing out one little detail that actually gives us so much more depth. He was Martha's relative. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, this is my uh, my three times great grandfather, y'all. Yeah. So it's a matter of not only that Martha was a breeder, but Martha was his blood. His blood he was, relative. He was breeding. He was he, breeding his. Blood he was breeding his grand, breeding his grandchildren. He was selling his grandchildren. He was breeding his daughter, selling his grandchildren. So, you know, how do you deal with that? So how do you, you know? I don't. I don't know how to. Do, I don't know how to share that and this information that really needs to be shared. You know, it's stuff that that people really need to talk about. In the current environment, where you're gonna, where you would be called racist. Right, because if I bring this up, I'm being racist when I bring this up. But you just told me the story in the car on the way here about someone who flipped the script where they showed a black person as the enslaver and the white person as the enslaved, and then they called it racist. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's what it is. Why is it racist then, but not racist now? This is this is the conversation that we're trying to have. This is what we want to open up and we want to get people out because I'm, I'm tired of today. I'm not even going to lie to you. I'm tired. I'm so sick of today. So I'm just so thankful for Brian for figuring out a way for us to have this conversation because I'm telling y'all I'm a, I'm a bit tired. Oh, the, the name of the book, and this is for Grace, is called An Edgefield Planter and His World, the 1840s Journal of Whitfield Brooks. Um, after the show, we'll try to take um, a quick picture of it and we'll post it on the, um, we'll post it in the comments section. Yeah, we'll even post a link for it because it's awesome. It's an awesome book. Um, but it's written by a gentleman called James O. for Orange Farmer Jr. Yeah. So that's James O. Farmer Jr. Because again, I, my ancestry is the flip side of yours. You have a female breeder, I have a male breeder. Right. Um, my four times great grandfather, Lewis Matthews, nine different women so far, and about 36 kids that we've, and, that, that, and we know that that's not all of them. <laughs> and I've, you know, I've shared my kind of findings on the Genealogy Adventures website, and you know, I, I've taken some heat for that. Breeding never existed, Ugh. didn't happen. And I'm like, his own, Lewis's own white enslaving father referred to him as a breeding, a breeding. man. Exactly. I mean, um, one of our, our beloved genealogists who have passed on, Gail Bush, she actually wrote in their book, um, the name of the book just went all out of my head. Mind, I'm sorry, Nathan. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna put we're gonna post the name of that book on in on the comments. But she wrote in that book how she learned from one of um the Burton books that her ancestors were breeders, said the same thing. These are prime breeding women. And so, you know, you you gotta this is this is true stuff. This is real stuff. They, nobody's playing with it, you know? But again, the good thing about being a public historian and writing about chapters of history that people don't really want to revisit is if you do get pushback, because <clears throat> again, when I got pushback about Lewis, I had Drury Cook Matthews' words. Lewis was a breeder. <laughs> and I just took, with my little mobile phone, I just took a, a snap of the document. Yeah, this posted, is a picture yeah, now. Posted, <laughs> off, posted it, and it's like, what part of this is fabricated? And then this is the other conversation I want to get into about public historians and genealogy. We get accused of being revisionists. Oh, well, you're just revising history. Right. How right. can you, when you have an original document 
in front of you. That's not a that revision. That person's words. It's not a revision. It's not revision. It's not a revision. Like it, there's, there's no way. This is not a revision. These are his exact words. This man literally put into in here the journals of Whitfield Brooks. The only things that he started to take out was because one of the things that the South Carolinian um, enslavers or planters, what they were doing was they would always mark the weather. So the first two months, he did it with word for word. But then after that, he just took out the weather. You didn't know about yeah. the weather, but you knew the other things that was going on. And he stated in here that that's what he was doing. That's why this book is just, this is an amazing, I was not expecting this book to be like this. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I wasn't expecting it. And um, Catherine, Catherine responded to what you said. She was like, it's a correction. Well, Catherine, you were, I was going to mention you next, actually. <laughs> Go ahead, we'll mention um, Catherine. <laughs> because, again, Catherine, who has been on the show previously, she's written an amazing book um, called Unveiled, which is about the 1619, 1620 Africans who arrived in Virginia. She's taken huge heat for what she's written because there is this argument I want to say it's semantics, but it's not, it's, not, it's not really semantics. But there is an argument about what class of people those first Africans who arrived in Virginia were. There were people who said that they're slaves, which they weren't. They would have been slaves if they had, their voyage had continued to Mexico, but it didn't. They got intercepted by the British. Right. And they got, well, they were taken everywhere, but they eventually ended up in Virginia. That's bad. You know, the fact is they were servants of some description. Now, were they indentured servants or were they servant servants? That probably needs a lot more research and investigation. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear that they're not slaves. Right. But you have historians who are part of an organization, I'm not going to name, because I really don't want to get into that on Twitter. Of course, of course. Um, who will stand in front of conferences, who will speak at conferences and say these people were slaves. And it's like, why are you perpetuating the same old story? which brings us to a point that we wanted to talk about, right. is I think public, public historians are really important for marginalized people. So I don't care if your ancestors were poor whites living in the back of beyond, if they were pioneers, settlers, black, Hispanic, mm -hmm. whatever you were, if you come from a marginalized community or if your ancestors did, I think that those are, those are the really powerful stories. Yes. Because, you know, a lot has been written about the great and the good, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, I find it really fascinating re reading about my ancestors who were. But the ones that really move me are the ones who were poor <laughs> or enslaved or free people of or color the things or that Native you, Americans Right, or because you learn <laughs> what they've gone through and, and their struggles yeah. and how they continue to still move on through all of those different things. So, which takes us into the devil's part. It does indeed. So, so Donnie and I have been having many discussions over the last couple of weeks, tying what we know from our ancestry and our family histories to kind of what's going on today. Um, so we've talked a little bit about breeding. Um, what really kind of highlighted the show for me today was two, two TV series. One is called uh, American Gods, where they had a very, very powerful opening, opening segment where you had a I still can't remember the actor's name. Really famous actor portraying an, an ancient African god on a slave ship. He was the Seven Up guy. Yeah, I wish I could remember. I his can't name. think of his name. I was supposed to pull it up. Okay, go ahead. But honestly, it was one of the most powerful kind of TV speeches from a from a black character that I think I had ever heard. Ever. And it was two minutes. It wasn't any longer than that. But it was things like he when he was speaking to them, he's like, "Y'all don't even know that you're black." He's like, and that's the nice name they're going to call you when you actually go mm. to America. That's the land of milk and honey, but not for you. I'm sorry, it's powerful. It, it is was, extreme. You can look it up on YouTube. <laughs> and then we the, don't we 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 don't want to put anything out there because we don't want to be sued. I later don't. On. I don't, don't want to be sued. <laughs> right. We don't want to be sued. But just go on and you know we can talk about it. It's American Gods. Look up American Gods too on on YouTube. And um, I'm trying to find the guy's name. And the other show that was, again, made this show today very, very topical was the Tulsa riots of Ugh. 1921, which was the opening sequence for The Watchmen, which is a new show on, on HBO. HBO. 
powerful, powerful, powerful opening sequence. And what really amazed me was that so many people had never, ever heard of the Tulsa riots, never heard of it. Um, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. I wanted, um, there's like the, the devil's punch bowl. Uh, there's, um, it's just, all of these things that we're talking about is, I guess, taking us into the differences between what is a riot and what is a massacre too. Yes. So. But the devil's punch bowl basically happened in Natchez, Mississippi, um, around 1865, where no one really knows how many, but approximately 20,000 newly freed slaves um, were corralled in this camp, um, this place called the Devil's Punch Bowl, where thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. Um, and that really hasn't been covered as, as much as much as it ought to be. How long did we try spending yes last night just to find the year I, that it actually happened? I think it was like um, was about it? thirty to forty-five minutes yeah. just to find that. But is it it? you know it took forever you it shouldn't and, and that's just the bottom line it it shouldn't it shouldn't take forever to learn those different things now we're not saying that none of this stuff is being taught in history in history classes they may be taught in you know um higher education they may go into it through 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 those types of things but i am wondering if it is harped upon like Gettysburg and winning in Gettysburg or, you know, or, mm. or the boat of George Washington and his people going across the, 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 which river was that? Potomac. The Potomac. Yeah. You know, I mean, these things are, are pushed in our heads. They're pushed. Those kind of things are pushed in our heads. Why aren't we learning about this other stuff? Why aren't we learning the good and the bad? Well, I think the thing that frustrates me is, and I can only go by my own high school experience, we kept learning about the same history over and over and over again huh. every, every single year. But when it came to really horrible things that happened to marginalized people, nothing, really. Right. The only thing that I think we even remotely touched upon was um, attacks by Native Americans on colonials. Right. Um, and, and, then, and I'm not saying that they didn't talk about bad things, because, I mean, let's just be clear. This is Preston Brooks' father, okay, you guys? And you guys know I talk about Preston all the time. But Preston was the one that beat Charles Sumner on the Senate floor. Now, we all know who Charles, Charles Sumner is. We know because of the beating. But you never knew the name of the man. They literally don't put the name of the man who did the beating. It is not there. It is not listed. They just said he was beat. I think... They even said it was a South Carolinian senator, but that's about it. They didn't give his name. However, South Carolina raised this dude up like he was the god of all gods when he did what he did. So South Carolina, people may know, oh, that was Preston Brooks. But they did it because they know because they're proud. They were proud of what he did at that time. And Virginians, because Virginian. I actually came across this crazy, crazy story. Because he actually he, broke his, he beat Charles Sumner so bad. He broke his cane. He broke his cane. You know, I know. And the, Virgin, <laughs> the Virginians did like this huge collection. I think they bought him something like it was it thirty or forty canes. It wasn't just Virginians, South Carolinians. I mean, people and Joe, because there's, I think there's a place in Louis, it's either Georgia or Louisiana, that's named Brooks, and it's named after him. I'm not sure if it was Georgia or Louisiana. But yeah, so the South may know his name, but the North did not. I've been in the North all my life, and I've seen the pictures of the man standing over Charles Sumner being beat. But how do you think I felt when I was doing my research and my great-great-grandmother kept pushing me, pushing me, because I learned his name as I was doing my research on her. And then she was like, oh, look him up. Look up Preston Brooks. Well, Whitfield was the first person that owned her. Lemuel was the last person. Why you want me to go to the middle? Look up Preston Brooks. So I just typed in Preston Brooks. And here is that famous caricature of a man standing over another man with a cane, swinging, dropping, just dropping this cane on this man's head. And two other senators standing behind of him, one with a gun like this, telling them, no, nah, they got to fight. 
Mind you, that's Lawrence Key. Mm -hmm. That's the Virginia senator. Yeah. So this is why this is going on. And bear in mind, this all happened. This happened on the Senate floor, not the con not the Congress. Senate floor. floor. Senate, the United States Senate floor. That's right. So guns drawn and people. <laughs> People beating each other. Right. It's so. just, it, it was the craziest, craziest thing. But again, I think what both of us were also chatting about last night is just how much we've learned by, by people who do, who are public historians in writing about this. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about voter suppression. Yes. People are, I get the sense that people are acting like voter suppression for, again, marginalized people is some sort of a new phenomenon. And there were just a couple that we actually wanted to go over. Because um, a lot of them aren't really discussed as much as they should be. So in terms of South Carolina, there are two. There's the Phoenix riot and the, the Parksville riot. And correct me if I'm wrong, South Carolina acknowledges the Phoenix riot, but does not want to discuss the Parksville riot. It's in, like it never happened. And the, the first time... Um, the Phoenix riot happened in 1898, and Parksville was 19, 1884. Sorry, 18, 1884. And you gotta be on, you gotta be careful with the Parksville one because they were lying from the beginning. If you have my book, you've read it, but they were lying from the beginning about the Parksville riot because um, it was my ancestor, that, one of my <laughs> one of my uh, one of my grandfather's cousins that was a part of it. So he was being blamed for killing a guy and they had to get him and they felt like the statute of limitations was running out. So they changed the date from 1884 to 1886. Then they turned around and said, no, it was 1885. And it, it was just, finally it came out that it happened in 1884. So that particular one, that's just like the devil's punch bowl. When did it happen? You know, I hear about it, mm -hmm. but when did it happen? So differences riot massacre a riot is something when you have people who are fighting against something well, i was going to read <clears throat> you're going to read the definition i'm going to read the definition okay um so one of the things i'm going to be writing about as a public historian is the difference between a riot and a massacre because again what we were talking about last night i always have the feeling that when groups of people of color are involved in a situation hmm. It is always called a riot. Always. So I'm going to read this definition, and then we're going to revisit some of these voter suppression, what are called riots, but I'm actually calling them massacres. So the definition of a riot. <clears throat> a riot is a form of civil disobedience commonly characterized by a group lashing out in a violent public disturbance against authority, property, or people. Riots typically involve theft, vandalism, and destruction of property, public or private. So bear that in mind. A massacre is the intentional killing of a considerable number of people under circumstances of atrocity or cruelty or contrary to the norms of a civilized people. Right. So in my opinion, Tulsa was not a riot. It was not a riot. Tulsa it was a, was massacre. a massacre. It was a massacre. Mm. The, um, the, now, let's look at Parksville. Okay. Parksville was started because of a group of white men harassing black people. But according to the writings of it, it was the opposite. It was switched up. Well, to cut along, <clears throat> I guess to- To, to shorten to it. To shorten it. So I can't, again, the, you're talking about the Parksville? Parksville, okay, this is so John Yale So, okay. So that's 1884. It right. was coming up to an election. Right. These were, again, fair, you know, still fairly newly freed people. They were keen, you know, the men were keen to vote because remember the women couldn't vote right. back then. And this is all about <laughs> voter suppression. They were trying to stop that. And so they were, you know, they went into town. They went to register to vote because Mr. Talbert was, um, I think he was, he was running for office actually, but Mr. Talbert. I don't think it was Talbert. It was another guy. Talbert. Talbert, it was Talbert, you yeah. sure? Okay. <laughs> so basically he got a lot, of black, a lot of black people to go and register to vote. And to say that they were met with stiff resistance and opposition is an understatement. And the reason that was given for the violence over the next three or four days that followed was that a black person pulled out a gun and started firing, which was not not the true. Case. 
It was not true. There was no gun to be had. I mean, there was a gun. There was a gun, but it wasn't pulled out. John was the one, which was my my um grandfather's cousin. He was the one that had the gun. And then after he had the gun, he was like, yeah, I, I got one. I'm here to protect myself. And they looked at him like, okay. He leaves, and then they send this whole posse after him. So is that a riot? Or is that a massacre? And they're going to shoot up these men that they felt like they needed to shoot up because they had a gun. Is it a riot or is it a massacre? Well, one thing led to another. One of the white men was killed and John had to go and read the book if you want to know the rest because <laughs> it's, it's a great story. But um, but for days, they were, you know, <clears throat> the law was literally riding out on horseback, shooting and hanging pretty much any person of Phoenix? color. I that was both. It was both of them. Okay. Um, killing everyone that they could get their hands on. That's true. Going. That's true. Because John even stated that there were so many men that died in the river that were drowned. Yep. And I mean, when is it a riot and when is it a massacre? What was the Oklahoma bombings? Was that a massacre? Was that a riot? You know, when people, what was the LA, what they called the LA riots? Was it a massacre or was it a riot? The LA riots was a riot. That was yeah. an actual riot. That's when all of this stuff, ha that's when they just went off because Rodney King was beat. And in some instances, I just found out that one of the reasons it wasn't just because of Rodney King, it was because of this young girl that was shot and she was paying for her soda. And this is what this is a part of what the riot was about. But that's a riot. Tulsa, those people were doing their thing. That was Black Wall Street. They were making their own money. They were living their own lives. And these people did not like it. And they went on that main street and they started killing people. Just literally just taking them out, dropping bombs. Philadelphia, drop the bomb on Philadelphia. Why? For what? Did, when was that? I think 18, we, no, 1968. Oh, no, 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 that was my, 1980. That was like 1980. Oh, 1985. That was it. 1985, <laughs> a, drop, a bomb was dropped in a neighborhood in Philadelphia. For what? You know, we're, it is, I need for people to honestly and truly wake up. I need you to see, take the blinders off, look at what's going on around you, be mindful of it. If it's hurting you, then deal with it. If it's not hurting you, then you on the other team. And that's just, I, that's just how I see it. I have to bring myself down because I'll start saying stuff that I ain't got no business saying. Well, so. I think what you, <laughs> I think what you were, what you were saying in the last bit is even if you don't feel as though, or even if you know, you don't have skin in the game, because that seems to be an American expression that I'm hearing all the time. You shouldn't close your eyes to it. If it, if it goes against what a, what a civilized society would would say is, right. is wrong, you should step up. And you call should step it out. up and call it out. And That's exactly it, out. it. So Catherine says Florida had the I hope I'm saying this right. Oki massacre in 1920. 100 years ago, black families were killed, homes burned, and they run and they ran out of town. Their land stolen all over the vote, definitely a massacre. But Catherine, was that called a massacre or was it called a riot? See, those are the things that we're trying to, to, to point out. Why is it that when, when black people do something, it's considered a riot? Why is it that we can't celebrate? I went to Jackson State University, go Tigers. And if we won something huge or big or whatever, and we went out and did the same thing that people at Virginia University, University of Virginia did, and they flipping cars, turning things on, you know, making things on fire. Oh, those are just boys will be boys. But if we went out and did the same thing at Jackson State, would we be just boys will be boys? Would we be thought of in that, in that way? Or was it a riot? Well, using another example, <clears throat> and this one's a Native American one. I want to get the year right. I think it's 1622 when the, the Native Americans attacked Henricus and Jamestown in Virginia and is always classed as a massacre. The, the story, basically, whenever you read about it, the words go, the Native Americans massacred the European colonials. 
but it never worked the other way. And when I actually dug into that story, it's like, well, I kind of know a little bit about Kalinke history. Um, I know, know a little bit about them in terms of culture. I have a lot more to learn. I'm like, well, what would prompt them to just out of the blue right. cross a river and just start slaughtering? Because I mean, I lost a lot of white European um, family members in that attack. Come to find out, it was a retaliation uh, because the people, the the, col the colonials were starving. So the men got this bright idea. Of, well, under the car cover of darkness, let's go. And get some food. Let's. But they weren't even going to take. They weren't even going to take just enough to survive. They were going to clean them out. That was the, that was the Palinkis' winter store of food, so that mm. they could survive. So you know, you can imagine someone rocking up into your kitchen, going through your cupboards, taking every bit of food. No, you I can't have. imagine none of that. And you're just going to sit back <laughs> and go, "Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to feel too upset about that. Go carry on, help yourself." So, if anything, again, reading these histories and, and wanting to share these histories, there is usually a reason for why the situation went down. And I think we again we could just have a lot more contrib contributions towards that end. Right, and I think that this is something that we can share because in all in all, he, like he said, he had a lot of family that died during that thing. But if if that family portion is kept out of the history, then it it doesn't hold as much impact. Yeah. So maybe maybe in history classes, and you know, we need to start adding families into this. This is where we as genealogists can have that seat at the table. We can't keep sitting up in here and letting all this stuff just kind of go past seeing these things, this history constantly repeating itself. Cause I'm telling y'all the, the, the history of a, the, the Parksville riot is a repetitive thing. It's repetitive without the fighting in so many, in so many words, it's repetitive without the fighting. That's it, it was straight voter suppression that all of that was going on. Same thing with 1898 and the Phoenix. Now you know more about the Phoenix riot, but we had who Essex Harrison, mm -hmm. which was a possible, I think he was a grandfather, one of my grandfathers. He was. He was definitely one of my grandfathers somewhere back in the line. He was hung. Mm -mm. He was shot on the side of the road like a dog. Oh, oh, yeah. He knows more about that. I couldn't read that. Old man. And he, he was, was an old man old man shot on the side of the street it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense like it, it it just really just doesn't make any sense all for wanting to vote that's it so donnie and i you know we see we sing this loud and clear there is a phrase that upsets us enormously i am not my grandfather's negro mm. it really it it really upsets us because we know the price that was paid literally in blood for us to even have the right to vote yeah yeah I want to be my, I, I, I want to be them. If I could be like them, if I could be like them and, and have, you got to understand, if they were not who they were, we would not be where we are today. We would not be who we are today. So to come out and say, I'm, I'm, I'm not that person. I mean, I get what you're saying. I, I understand the, the concept of it. You know, I got my hood side. Okay. <laughs> I got I got my hood side. I, I understand what you're saying. But our children today have to understand that they are about as close to what was going on during the civil rights movement as any generation outside of the civil rights generation. They are there. So they need to understand that they cannot just jump out there and start beating people up because you're the ones that's going to be grabbed, snatched, arrested, beat, shot, killed. Your moms are going to be upset. Your dads are going to be upset. It's going to be, it's, you got to take heed from those civil rights. One of my, one of my favorite videos is that tall statuesque black man walking down the street and he's being spit on, kicked, pushed, he got his hat, his suit on, everything, and he kept right on walking. He kept he kept going. You got to be those people. Unfortunately, you have to be those people because now you have a different set of laws that are protecting you than they had. They didn't have the same the reason why they did those things 
was so that you could have those laws. That's what, that's the thing. They did those things because you can have those laws. So now if somebody kick, push, spit on you, you have a law to back you up. He didn't have one, but he was strong enough to keep moving so that you would. So be that, be, be them. Don't, don't not be them. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. And Karen has asked a really good question. What do you think is the resistance to the existence of breeding? Why do you think people don't, why do you think people just don't believe breeding actually happened? Because it's probably the most horrific thing in slavery that could have happened. And they already don't want to remember slavery as is, you know, I mean, they don't, they don't want to talk about it. They don't, you know, when you talk about slave, I mean, think about it. Slavery and lynching is actually two, two separate things. So when you, they don't want to talk about lynching, then it's no way they're going to get into the bowels of what slavery actually did. And that is one of the most horrific things. And I'm going to tell you why. Breeding is one of the most horrific things. So I'm going to tell you like this. My mother and, and one of our um, genealogists, the late Sheila Hightower, they were second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, literally y'all. Sheila has a breeding man. Again, I have a breeding woman. We have absolutely no idea where our black line connects. That's because as a breeding woman, once she has the child, the child is taken and sold. So I have cousins out there that I have no idea who they are. And they don't know who we are. They don't even know who their mothers are. So Brian is related to me through Martha Brooks. But we're not sure how yet. He's related to me through Martha. But what if Brian and I were attracted to each other? This is my cousin. And it's because of Martha that he's my cousin. Well, one of the reasons. It's because of Martha that he's my cousin. So with that being said, I'm getting ready to have relations with my cousin. And I don't even know it because of the fact that her child was taken. This is why breeding is probably one of the most, if not the most horrific thing. And this is why they won't, they don't want to accept it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to know that it exists. Because the, you know, the other side of the same coin is again, child that's a product of breeding, doesn't know who he, you know, doesn't know who he, he or she her parents are, so they don't have an identity. So now you fast forward, you know, a couple of generations, the great migration, mm. a lot of, you know, just tons of people moving from the South to the North and the West. And the West. And falling in love, getting married, having children. They could be, you know, they could have very easily married their cousin completely by accident because they don't Because they don't know. That's what breeding did. That's, that's, all breeding i don't care what nobody say that's breeding and that's the separation that's the separation of families that's what that did to us and i'm going to say i think the other thing that people find really hard to accept is that there was a class of americans enslaving americans who classed human beings as a cash crop mm -hmm. breeding you know there were breeding plantations that's all they did they that's breed it. slaves they didn't have a farm they didn't raise tobacco, cotton, indigo, none of that. Right. They were, they were basically creating human beings for sale. So um, I have two things. So Karen said, Holocaust deniers irritate me to no end, just as do the folks ignoring slavery and breeding as our history. And that's true. Holocaust survivors go through the same thing. They that they, they literally go through the exact same thing. And then Brandy Neal says they don't want to talk about it because it unveils the inhumanity of their ancestors and they identify with their ancestors. You know, okay, let me, let me say this. And Brandy, you're right about that, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to tell y'all who I identify with. I identify with Preston Brooks. I'm going to tell you why I identify with him. I identify with him because I see me in him. This man has said things that I have said to my own. It, it blew my mind to, fig, to find out that I've actually said the exact same words to a person when they were trying me. He was being tried by Wickfall. And he told him, look, you in here, you writing this letter. This is in a newspaper. You're writing this letter. 
and you're doing it anonymously. My name is Preston Brooks and I live here. You got a problem with me, you come and handle it. When I tell y'all, I, I right hand, this is my life, okay. <laughs> right hand to God, I said the exact same thing to somebody. You got a problem with me, this is where I live, come and handle it. That's who I am. Not to mention the fact that I also have so many family members who are into politics. Who's to say that it didn't come from them? So I actually identify, but just because I identify with him to a certain degree, doesn't mean that I have to like what he did, how he did it, when he did it, or why he did it. So, you know, this, we went through this show really fast. We did, I was just gonna, <laughs> uh, just because Kevin actually shared that his parents were distant cousins, and I was gonna say, Kevin, if anyone had actually told me that my parents were distantly related, in more than one way, I think I found eight different ways that they were distantly related to each other, um, and all through slave, all through slavery. Some they share common black ancestors, but most of them are actually commonly shared white enslaving families. Yeah. Um, and Catherine just made a huge statement. She says the child who is a product of breeding slash trauma is passed down through DNA. Man, is that forever true? Mm -hmm. Post traumatic slave disorder is real it's a real thing and if people don't know anything about it look up epigenetics yep. just look it up just look it up because it's a real thing epigenetics is a real thing so I'm so glad we had this conversation you just <laughs> let me get so much off my chest today <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I try I try Gosh. <laughs> I needed that, but yeah, so this show, um, we're going to have another one like this. I think mm -hmm. we should, I think, cause this, we have a lot of people who are, we weren't able to read some of the comments and, and we, I don't think I'm the only one that needed to get something off my chest. I think there were others that needed to do it as well. And, um, we're going to do another show. I don't know when we'll let y'all know, but let's, let's have another form like this where everybody can just like really get it off. But the next form, let's talk about how we can get this out here to the broader spec, you know. But what I would say is, if you're thinking about writing up your own family history, or you know, even if you've started, I would encourage you to just make sure that you source, you yes. list all of your sources so people can see where you're getting your information from, because that's one of the first things that historians will challenge you on. Um, so understand what's a really good source, um, also citations, if you can add, if you can take pictures of documents that you're using to, yes. to write your stories, do that, put them in. Because um, we really don't want to give people any more ammunition than, um, than we have to. Hey, I load all of my writings, usually with, um, well, most of my writings with um, sources, citations, and, and graphic. Yeah. And I still get challenged. Yeah. And my, my book has every, every, Thing that I ever found <laughs> it is written down and I've had so many people that actually said you know my book was well sourced that's because I don't want anybody coming back to me telling me that I was wrong yeah. but again it was like um Catherine Knight's book yes about unveiled that whole Twitter storm that I inadvertently kind of dropped myself into I kept saying read the book buy the book look at the sources I got so angry at one point I'm flipping through Catherine's book, taking pictures of <laughs> taking pictures of the the citations and sources. Going, yeah, there, there. Yeah. So, thank you guys for coming in, for listening in. Um, we definitely. I don't know about you, but I needed it. I needed it. And um, we. This is our blow off steam show. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody just said that Karen. She said yes. Another show to blow off steam. So that's what we're gonna call them from now on. It's gonna be hashtag blow off steam. Um, but hopefully, you know, in the, the, this hour long conversation that we've had, we've demonstrated why public historians are important. Right. And, you know, why, you know, hopefully it's going to encourage people to kind of go out there and, and share what their, their discoveries. Right. So thanks for coming in and, and checking us out today, you guys. Um, we'll be posting about the new, uh, next week's show on Monday. Yes. Tomorrow. Yes, we will. And just. Thank you for letting me vent. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to vent a little bit on that one too, because I'm gonna, I'm not, I ain't gonna lie. Um, that it's, scene out of um, The Watchmen with Atalsa. Yeah, that blew my mind. I, 
my eyes my eyes messed it up on that. Yeah, that was it that really was a did. big thing. That was a big thing. So I'm Danya. I'm Brian. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you guys next week. See you next week.